Jean Vigan Eushla, and you are very welcome to the online commemorative event to mark the 32nd anniversary of the murder of human rights solicitor Patrick Finucane. Normally on this evening we would be dressed up in very warm clothes and meet together on the corner of the Antrim Road with candles and we would remember the life of Pat Finucane and speak to the outstanding issues of truth and justice in this case. But this year, due to the pandemic, we meet online. But that provides us as well with an opportunity. And we are absolutely delighted to be able to welcome Congressman Brendan Boyle to this event, which we normally couldn't have done had we been having it locally. Representing Philadelphia, Brendan has taken an active interest in the matters pertaining to peace and justice in Ireland, and he is fast becoming the go-to voice for Irish America and has been strategically engaged in the protection of the Good Friday Agreement. And we are very honoured to be joined by John Finucan MP, a practising solicitor himself with his own law practice. John now, of course, is the representative for North Belfast and is at the forefront of political engagement with issues of truth and justice, as well as his father's case. So please sit back in the comfort of your own home and join us for this reflection as we discuss the issues of the day. I suppose before we begin, John and Brandon, and get into the interview, it would be remiss of us not to ask for your thoughts on what happened on the Ormer Road last Friday. John, you were at um, a meeting with the Chief Constable and with the relatives last night with the Sinn Féin leadership. What are your own thoughts uh, that you have in the wake of what happened? Well, I, I think, like everybody, we were shocked to see the events that unfolded on the Orme Road last Friday. Um, it represented the worst type of policing that we could see in this society. Every type of aggravating factor you could even dream of was present on the Ormer Road last Friday. And unfortunately, it didn't take place in a vacuum. This was not an isolated incident. And it is one of many incidents which have led to a, I think, to what the police need to accept is a watershed moment in policing here. Um, we saw just days previously, you know, clearly juxtaposed the image of 60 plus UVF masked men walking with impunity uh, around um, the streets of East Belfast, clearly designed to intimidate and possibly carry out even worse attacks uh, on their own community. And that comes after a series of events in which loyalism, again, in the eyes of people from the community that I represent, um, see acting with impunity, acting without any real engagement from the PSNI. And then on Friday, we see Mark Sykes double cuffed to the rear and put into the back of a police car. It was crass. It was vulgar. It was a very deliberate exercising of power in a way which wasn't proportionate. And I think the engagement and the response that we took within Sinn Féin from Friday immediately um, was necessary. Um, it needed to be made clear that this is not acceptable. This is not what policing is about. Uh, policing at its very heart needs to have relationships with their, the local community, no matter where in the world they are, but particularly here. And there is good work and there is progress, but that can be undone so easily. And the police need to recognise that they now have a serious job of work on their hands to repair the damage that was caused last Friday. Thanks for that. And I think that is a fair reflection of the anger and almost shock that went across the community on Friday. Brendan, did it reach across the ocean to Washington and to Philadelphia? Because it certainly had a massive impact here. No, you know, it's always interesting um, what events get um, known here or uh, popularized and then which ones don't. I don't think there's ever really any rhyme or reason. Now I am familiar with it because I've, as you mentioned, I, I actively follow uh, events throughout Ireland uh, but this event actually didn't get too much too much attention here. But what it does show is that, and this is regardless of the, the constitutional issues, um, you are going to have 40 plus percent of the population from one tradition and 40 plus percent from another tradition. And that's still gonna last for, for quite some time from today through decades in the future. So the ability to 
live together um, in, in peace with justice and to uh, combat those voices that re just refuse to do so. Um, that hard work remains. And I actually think of all of the outstanding issues, that is still the, the most difficult one. And I, I think unfortunately will be the hard work that those who live in, um, in Northern Ireland will have to carry out for some time to come. That's very interesting. John, the last time we heard you speaking extensively about your own father's case was at the end of November when Brandon Lewis made a statement in the House of Commons that many people thought might have been at last an announcement of a public inquiry, but instead it caused shock really across the world. Could you talk to us briefly about why there were reasonable expectations that a public inquiry would have been announced and your own reaction that day? Yeah, the, the, the build-up to November 2020 really began in earnest in around February 2019 because it was then which we received our Supreme Court judgment, which was a, a victory for, for us as a family, as a campaign. And the Supreme Court was unequivocal and unambiguous in its language when it said that there had never previously been an effective human rights compliant investigation inquiry into the murder of my father. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because the British government have previously pointed to the De Silva report, the Corey report, the Stevens police investigation. And when you take those together, they have said, we have done everything that we can, that we are obligated to do, and we will not be doing any more. The Supreme Court effectively wiped that slate clean. And from February 2019, the British government said that they would be setting out their response to that judgment. So we waited and we waited and we waited and we waited some more until we were forced to bring the British government to court just to get a response. And it was through that court proceeding which the British government, one, accepted that they had taken far too long. They apologised for the delay, um, a sentiment which many families are well used to. And they committed to setting out their response uh, at the end of November. Now, we are not naive as a family. We've been on this journey for a very long time. But an analysis of the Supreme Court judgment, I think we felt that there was room for cautious optimism because the British government had effectively tried everything previously behind closed door reviews by the police, by a retired judge, by a, a barrister. So really there was very little left for them to do apart from do what they had previously promised to do, um, apart from what they really should have done a long time ago, and that was grant an inquiry. So th that was the context in which the announcement was made in November, and that announcement was effectively, we're going to have the local police and the local police ombudsman look at this. It was a bizarre response, and um, it was not one that I think warranted a 20-month delay. And I was actually personally bolstered by not just the local reaction, but the worldwide reaction to, to the statement. You can be... You know, you can worry as a family when you're on this type of a journey. Do you, you know, do you still get the support that you feel, you know, that you need to get to where you need to be so far on? And the world is such a busy place. There are so many important issues that require the attention of legislators all around the world. But the reaction from the Irish government, the reaction from political parties on this island, uh, political parties in, in England, but significantly in America as well, I, I think really did provide so much comfort to me, to my mum, to the rest of the family. And I think without, I hope this doesn't come across the wrong way, but to so many different victims that have been waiting for such a long time that they can see that there is such a significant support base out there that will continue to support families when they need that support. So that was the context in which the decision was made in November. It's no surprise to say that we have looked at that decision. We are going to have to litigate and judicially review that decision. Uh, so we will find ourselves back in the courts again. But I actually think the decision was so weak that the British government are, are on very thin ice with this one. Thank you for that. And I think it's difficult to try to condense so much legal information into something that's accessible, but somehow it has breached 
um, that divide that sometimes exists. And you can see that so many people are engaged in the case and absolutely understand the legal questions that are at stake. They basically know that the Finucans have got a raw deal in what has happened. Brendan, for you, I mean, you've met John a number of times now, you've got an understanding. And when when Brandon Lewis made his statement on that day, you 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 were were very vociferous. You talked us that talked about an appalling perversion of justice. Can you explain to us here why you sitting over in Philadelphia and Washington would take such an active interest in this case? Yes, well, I, as you mentioned, I've met uh, with John several times, uh, including before and after the, the announcement. Um, but I've actually met with his mother even more times uh, than that. She has been an active and frequent visitor to Capitol Hill. I think I might have first met her five years ago when I attended a um, committee hearing. I, I had already known about the case, uh, of course, for, for many decades. And so I purposely uh, attended a, a committee hearing, even though I wasn't on the committee, um, about human rights abuses that was chaired by a New Jersey Republican named Chris Smith. And uh, it featured the Finucan case, as well as the author of a book called Lethal Allies that looked at other cases of um, documented or heavily suspected collusion between uh, British state forces and acts of terrorism or acts of violence. Um, and so I, I first met her then and, and ever since have been quite active in making sure that there was as much attention on Capitol Hill and in the United States as possible because I know that when we pay attention and when we raise the issue with our British counterparts, um, there, it's more likely that there'll be, there'll be some activity and some result. I think we saw that obviously in, in the Brexit debate when yeah. we um, were quite uh, frequently raising our voices about the importance, the sanctity of the Good Friday Agreement and that there would be no US-UK trade deal if you saw the Good Friday Agreement violated, if you saw the reestablishment of a hard border on the island of Ireland. So we have a powerful voice and I think a, a role to play. And uh, I'm very interested and care deeply about making sure we play that role in this case, as, as well as uh, a number of others. And that's much appreciated. John, families like yourselves rely on the application of human rights law in the domestic courts, and I suppose internationally when families like yourselves have gone to Europe. But there seems to be two very strong realities. You have a political reality and you have a legal one, and they kind of collide. Can you, can you perhaps explore with us what the environment is for human rights law when there's a hostile Westminster government? Well, it is, and, and even, even in my last answer, I, I cited the example where we were forced to bring the British government to court just to get a response to a Supreme Court judgment, you know, and that in itself is significant. A lot, a lot happens here in the context of legacy that, not that we shrug our shoulders, but that we can not be surprised by things on a, on a continuous basis, which, which isn't good. And if we are told to believe and put our faith in the rule of law, and we have a decision from this jurisdiction's most senior court, that the government effectively brushed to one side and put on the shelf and ignore, and they're forced to respond to that only because of further litigation. I mean, that's that that's not right. Um, but this is a government which Brennan cited Brexit. In the context of Brexit, stood up in the House of Commons. In fact, it was our Secretary of State who said that he was quite willing to um, breach international law in a limited and specific way. Um, yeah. A defense I wish I could supply for my clients sometimes. <laughs> you know, it it, it, yeah. it it really I do feel I, I know we're joking, but you know, I, I do think that's representative of the culture uh, at the time. Um this is a British government who are introducing legislation which will end what they call vexatious prosecutions against their service personnel in overseas territories, as well as I think the clear intent that they want to do that in this jurisdiction. They have created a very hostile environment for those lawyers and solicitors who represent families, whether that's through civil courts, whether that's through the inquest procedures, whether that is legal representatives who will advocate and sometimes quite literally be the only voice for families that have no resource and have no voice. 
And I think that is worrying the, the mm-hmm. where this government intends to take that conversation. And then underneath all of that is, is a government that I think is quite clearly against having any real legitimate uh, and credible examination of what went on here. And they remain an obstacle. And I, I'm always conscious when we talk about legacy and we talk particularly about human rights here, it, it's very easy to be to be negative because there's a lot to point to that shows that. But we are blessed here with, you know, some amazing and imaginative lawyers, some of the best jurisprudence on Article 2 in the continent of Europe ha- has come from this jurisdiction. There, there is a commitment in the legal community, I think, to their clients and legacy that's hard to replicate in, in other areas. And the determination of families, the determination of groups like Relatives for Justice. I think when you put that together, it means that the government are always going to be in difficult ground to ignore uh, and to, I think, do their best to get out of what their legal um, and moral duties are when it comes to litigation, when it comes to legacy. So I think you have those two competing forces. And whilst it might be inch by inch, and whilst it does uh, inflict a cruelty of generational um, impact on, on families and gen- that, that generational fight. It, it's not something that's going away. And I do hope the government recognise that and respond accordingly rather than putting their resource and energies into creating obstacles. And I think that's really interesting. I mean, there's no doubt that statute and law will remain constant while governments come and go or governments have different emphasis. And I think that's something at least for families to hold on to. For yourself, Brendan, you have been at the eye of a storm around political norms and legal norms where the previous administration clearly fostered an environment where those international law, laws and norms were denigrated. And it's clear the next four years are going to be very different, at least in the US itself. But, you know, will this have international impact? Do you think, you know, in particular, do you think that international law can regain its currency after being diminished by the Trump administration and this administration in Westminster? Yeah, well, first, I, I'm obviously I was a strong supporter of, of Joe Biden throughout the, the campaign and uh, strongly campaigned for him, uh, including and especially in, in my own state of Pennsylvania. So one of the many reasons why I'm excited that he is now in the White House and not Donald Trump is because now the United States can regain its position as being a leader in the world in terms of supporting international laws and and international norms, promotion of democracy, standing up to dictatorships, et cetera. Um, It was awkward the last four years. For example, I remember one of the times they went on BBC or Sky News to oppose what Boris Johnson was proposing to do in ripping up the Northern Ireland Protocol that he had just negotiated and signed nine, 10 months earlier. And sure enough, the, the, um, the interviewer said, well, wait a minute, your president is ripping up all of these international agreements. Now, I pointed out I disagreed with that as well and was pretty outspoken about it, so I was not being inconsistent. But it did create a real problem when here, not only me, but a number of other uh, congressional colleagues of mine are, are standing up for the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, attempting to hold the British government Um, to what they had signed up to, and our own government is ripping up uh, international agreements left and right. So certainly, you know, a return to normality here uh, in the United States is is so welcome, and I think will help us uh, as we advocate um, for the, the, not only the establishment, but upholding the laws um, as they pertain uh, to all of Ireland. It's certainly, I think, it, it, a welcome change. <laughs> John, John, on a more personal note, you know, there's a, there's a huge focus, as you've said, on the issue of legacy and thousands of families who continue to see the, their rights to truth and justice diminished. Since becoming MP, you now have your own personal investment in the case of your father and a commitment to the issue of legacy, but you also have that political role. So, you know, does that complement, does it collide? Is it complex for you? I I haven't found it complex yet. And I think if anything, it it definitely complements 
the example since last Friday, you know, we started t- the discussion today about the Ormer Road and um, obviously, personally, I, I would have my views and, you know, the Ormer Road families would have my full support and particularly Mark Sykes after his arrest. But now that I have a political hat as well, that, that meant that I was in the meeting yesterday with the, with the chief constable in which we raised this. Um, and certainly I think it was important politically that, you know, we are there to hold police to account. We're there for critical engagement um, when it requires. So I think in the context of legacy, I have been able to raise our case uh, and others in the uh, in the Good Friday Agreement Implementation Committee, which as an MP you're a member of. Yeah. And I think it does provide you with access to be a voice on this issue when ordinarily you, you wouldn't be able to do that. So I, so I do think there is that compliment, definitely. I think that's interesting. Brendan, I, as you know, three weeks ago, three and a half thousand of these bereaved relatives um, signed an open letter to Antishak and to Boris Johnson seeking the implementation of the Stormont House Agreement derived from the Good, the Good Friday Agreement. And relatives, for, they chose to put the letter into the Irish Echo, both to include the diaspora who grieve in, in America, because there's lots and lots of relatives who are there, but also to persuade. And I suppose there's really with the Biden administration, there's so many hopes placed on an Irish American president, the most Irish American president since Kennedy, who, who will make a difference on Irish issues. Do you think in the midst of so many different issues, legacy stands a chance on getting commitment and focus. You know, I, I think of all of the, the issues that um, were uh, attempted to be resolved out of the Good Friday Agreement, um, I think this is still the most difficult one. I would say even more difficult than policing. Yeah. I, I think there's been more progress on the policing issue from where things were with the RUC 25 years ago to where we are today, even with the difficulties, I think this is probably the area where there's been the least amount of progress. Um, if we were to go back 25 years and perhaps had a, a truth and justice sort of reconciliation process, uh, similar to South Africa, perhaps we would be in, in a better situation today. Um, but be that as it, as it may, we're, we're here now in 2021. Um, I think this is also why having uh, the position of special envoy to Northern Ireland filled by someone who has a uh, background in these issues mm. is so important um, because it's pretty hard to, to suddenly get up to speed on, on the legacy issues. We do know, or this is my opinion at least, um, that if you don't have uh, an external actor from the United States pushing along the British side, uh, frankly, you're you're very unlikely to get much progress, especially candidly out of a conservative government um, that certainly you know considers itself a conservative and unionist government. And even recently, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, who was supposed to be neutral, uh, nonetheless, kind of you know said the quiet part out loud about the fact that he is unabashedly an advocate for one side over the other. So the importance of the American dimension remains. Um, and I think that the role of special envoy would be critical here to be on the ground, constantly raising these legacy issues. Uh, so that is something that I am pushing for here. And I'm optimistic that we will have a special envoy who uh, meets that description. That's really interesting. And it's interesting you raise policing um, and legacy when we see now legacy is actually absolutely being accused of rolling back much of the progress that we've made on policing and certainly creating a crisis in confidence. Um, you know, the longer we don't deal with legacy, um, the more it will impact policing. And so, you know, seeing the connection of those is so important. John, for yourselves, anniversaries, are, they're a time where every family reflects but necessarily your own anniversaries become much more public and they become public events, you know, with lectures and vigils and all of that. What does it mean for you as a son, a brother, a father to mark February 12th? It's, I think that's a difficult one to answer. Um, I, I was saying before we started today that the week over the years has 
it, it's had added significance. Um, my daughter's birthday uh, comes comes just after the anniversary. Um, my mum's birthday was always a couple of days before the anniversary. So there is the, the bittersweet nature of this week. But whilst there has always been a public element to the, the anniversary itself, it, it provides a sharp focus. I mean, I think anybody, no matter what the circumstances are, who, who loses somebody close, um, you know, that, that stays with you, sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes more than that, sometimes less. But the anniversary always brings it into sharp focus. Um, as I say, my, my my kids are grown up now, so you know they would ask questions around the anniversary. Um, and I, I think as a family, we just pull together. You know, I think that's what any family can, you know can, can do. That's really all you can do. And we probably deal with it, um, you know, differently. Um, you know, there's a very personal element to this. And again, I think this is a sentiment that's shared by so many people. Um, right across the community here, right across society where people are carrying carrying that with them and will remember on a daily basis. But anniversaries always present their own unique challenges, some years more difficult than others. Um, but I think it's, for us, we do appreciate the support that we get, especially on whether it is, and you're right about the weather, it's usually always a freezing cold night where we're standing um with having holding a candle as much for warmth as it is for, um, <laughs> um, but it's you know I, I think that always acts as a really strong source of um, you know strength and comfort for us. I know it does from a mother as well. So it's you know it, it's a day that that comes up. You know it's coming, but it doesn't always make it any easier. And I suppose for the rest of us, we're very privileged that your family choose to share that with us. And, you know, that is recognized as well because it's never easy. And yet you always do and are always so generous with, with those particular moments and times. And we're grateful for that. And on that note, and probably most appropriately, we're going to pause for music. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Connor and Sarah Caldwell, who will be playing the Emigrants' Farewell to Donegal. It's a tribute to Pat Finucane but it's also in recognition of the great support that you, Brendan, have offered to the cause for justice for Pat Finnick. Dear, you need not fear the day. 
And now I'm absolutely delighted to be finishing up by asking Pat's wife, Geraldine, to say a few words. Geraldine is, of course, a hero to so many. Her dignified tenacity is inspirational for so many of us. And in introducing Geraldine now, I want to take this opportunity to thank John and to thank Brendan on behalf of you all for a meal of my agav, agus lanagigafoil. First of all, I'd like to say thank you, Andre, um, for that introduction. And also thank you to Relatives for Justice for organising this event this evening. Also, it's been delightful that Congressman Boyle has been able to join us. And I suppose I mustn't forget John as well. Um, also, the music from Connor and Sarah was wonderful. It is once again a difficult time, but a very important time. 32 years ago to tomorrow, my husband was murdered. And the support that I have had over those 32 years and continue to have is remarkable. I'd like to thank everybody who is participating this evening and who has stood with us for all these years. Since the latest decision by the British government in November, I have been overwhelmed by the support that people have shown. People who normally wouldn't say anything to me, strangers have once again come forward and been appalled at what the Secretary of State decided to do. After our Supreme Court judgment, Two years ago, it took 20 months for the government to make any reply to us. And they only did it because I had to take them to court. Something I am loath to do, but more and more often it is becoming inevitable that that must happen because the British government will only make a decision when they're forced. This time, they handed it back to the police and the police ombudsman. I think that is what shocked people so much, that in the face of everything that had gone before, the decision from their highest court, all they could do was hand it to the police. Because of that decision, I am once again forced to go back to court and tomorrow we will be lodging papers. Once again, we will have to wait and see what comes out of it. But I know that as long as I can keep going, we will fight until we get the public inquiry that is necessary. But thank you once again to everyone.